Hey, and welcome to this week's episode of On the Couch with me. And for this week, I've got Nandile Tiali with me. He is the fitness trainer for the Bizap High Health Lions. And I'm excited to just share with you, or not share with you, uh, get your thoughts on fitness and cricket and the mind and how things are intertwined and inter interrelated. Um, yeah, so to get us started, um, maybe just tell us a little bit more about who you are, what you do, and how you sort of got onto this path of being a fitness trainer for the Lions. Okay, well, thank you for having me, Jody. Um, my name is Nandini Jody, like uh, Jody has said. So, um, basically, I come from King Williamstown, which is a little town in the Eastern Cape. Yeah. It's about 50 k outside of uh, East London. And then I grew up there, um, and I went to school at Dale Junior. Then after that, in 2004, high school, I went to Solomon College. After that, I did my matric, um, matric in 2008. Went to Fort Hill University. I was blessed enough to have a bursary via Cricket South Africa to study and play cricket at the varsity there. So I did my first year in Human Movement Science in 2009, did second year in 2010, 2011, third year. Uh, fourth year I did my honours. But 2010, halfway throughout, I started developing more of a passion for fitness because I was studying it and actually not the playing side. Yeah. And so that's when I actually started. Uh, I volunteered. While I was actually supposed to be a player, I actually volunteered with the coach and I said, let me actually help out with the warm ups. And then I started trying to implement a lot of stuff I learned in the classroom on the cricket field or okay. before you start a game and afterwards, you know, okay. pre and post. So I did that and then throughout my time with volunteer, um, I know Cricket South Africa like to host a camp there, uh, the under 16 Kevin camp. So I started volunteering there as well as just part of hours and just getting experience under the belt. And then when I was finished in 2012, I graduated in my honors. Then 2013, I got employed uh, uh, by Cricket South Africa at the academy there to help him for Nico Gum, who was the, who was the head coach. Yeah. And then I just started doing the fitness from there on, and then, uh, yeah, the passion just grew from there onwards. I uh, worked at the academy, I worked for a couple of other teams, I did a lot of invitation games, um, I did a lot of uh, Cubs weeks with the AC under 17 teams and invitation teams. Um, I did a lot of uh, uh, what's it called shadowing at the Warriors a bit, and I did some at the Knights, and then I was on my own for the past two years at the National Academy running that myself. So that was pretty cool. I enjoyed yeah. that. And from there on, when the opportunity came, when I saw a vacancy at the Lions, I thought, yeah, this is a chance for me. And then I applied and, yeah, I, I you got, got the, the job. job and, uh, lucky guy. <laughs> yeah, and now I'm here, yeah. So it's pretty cool that part of your story is that you volunteered at the start. And I think so many times, cricketers, coaches, um, they want everything to just come to them, you know? So yes, we do the work, but we want things to just come to us. So you actually gave some of your time up for free, yes. by the sounds of it, you know, no, no pay to just get the experience and, and to be seen sort of in those different environments. Yes, and for me, that, that's, uh, that was the biggest thing. My, my lecturer, Dr. Marathon Kant at the time, she was the one that uh, actually guided me in that regard and said, start by volunteering. You know, we as students expect things to come. We say, where are the jobs? Where is this? Where is that? But instead of us going out at first and getting a lot of experience and sort of making the mistakes beforehand, before yeah. you're actually in an important position, and that's how you start learning, yeah. you know, so that, that was pretty cool, yeah, yeah. it was really cool. And it's a big up for you for actually doing that and mm. listening to, to mm. the professor. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So, as a fitness coach, right, what would you say are two or three things that you, are, are like the biggest things that you've learned so far in this job when it comes to cricketers in particular? Okay, well, what I've learned so far, uh, I would say, is that cricketers, the way you approach them in terms of training and conditioning is quite different to maybe your rugby players. Your rugby players sort of take on the challenge either way because of the nature of the sport. Yeah. They kind of, the conditioning and the, and the rugby links very, very closely and, and significantly together. With cricket, you have to try and be able to address the skill, if I can say that. So you know that you've got 11 fielders and you've got batsmen, you've got bowlers. Mm -hmm. So the approach of your conditioning in that, what I've learned is that the, 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 the exercises you prescribe are sort of trying to help the guys in that particular skill. So you know that you can't exactly, for example, train for a four-day game, if I can put it that way. Yeah. You, you can't have a practice session from 10 to 5. But what you can do, coupled with the training session they're going to have with the skill, you can induce, introduce other components that are going to enhance his ability to withstand the, the, yeah. the demands of a four-day game yeah. or the demands of a, a short turnaround in T20 cricket. So that's one thing I've learned. The second thing I've learned is that uh, cricketers in generally, in the off season, yeah. they, they, they're very keen on training. So your training at that period of time is very crucial because 
that sets them up to peak at the right time when the season's about to start. Yeah. And therefore, when the crunch time comes and it's game time and there's not so much time to, to train, yeah. their levels don't regress as much. They're still pretty heightened. So yeah. those are about the two things I've learned so far. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so, so what would you say to a club cricketer, right, who's, who's just out there? What advice would you have for that club cricketer or school cricketer mm. in terms of with everything else they have to do, right? Mm. This isn't their full-time job. Mm. Mm. How would you advise them to go about their fitness? What I would advise, especially for, 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 let's say, school or club, is before practice, if your practice is scheduled maybe at half past two after yeah. school and you've got time, arrive at the minute at two o'clock, do a few push-ups, do a few sit-ups, have a few laps around the field. Yeah. If you've been doing no training at all and you want to start training, yeah. start by the basic stuff, the body weight stuff, the stuff you know of, that everyone knows of, that you don't have to get a professional to, to, to um, see you or watch you do it. So that's how you, you, you basically start getting into the fitness. Once your body is able to tolerate that and you don't get as tired as much from the push-ups, the sit-ups, the squats and the running, then if you can, start linking up with maybe a trainer around in your area or in the, in the gym close by to you and then they can advise you in terms of taking your training forward to more specific and more direct training. Okay, okay, I think that's solid advice, right? So use the better time that you have as to the best of your ability. Yes, definitely. Uh, would you say that from a cricket point of view, um, you know, you talk about batters, bowlers, would you say that the training that you do is, is very, um, role dependent in that sense, so batters, bowlers, all-rounders, that your, your training programs are, are designed specifically to the individual versus the whole squad does this? Yes, I would say it's, it's my approach is, would be more individualistic at first in terms of the skill, yeah. like you're saying, so in the off-season generally I'll target the body, the individual's body, so if I've got a couple of bigger guys yeah. who need to lose a bit of weight, they'll train differently, and a couple of smaller guys who need to maintain weight or gain a bit of weight, they'll train differently. But after that phase and the next phase comes in when it's now pre-season, yeah. now I start directing the skill. So I want my fast bowlers to be, uh, with their weight-bearing abilities to be good at the crease, they must have strong legs, mm -hmm. so I'll make sure they have that. I want my batsmen to be agile because they have to turn for the twos and threes. So they, they, their training program in terms of agility mm -hmm. will be directed more in that. They also have to be more powerful in the sense that rotation, they hit a lot. So they have to have a good core strength. And then my bowlers have to have more, I would say, overhead strength because they, their energy in their, in, their, in their bowling is channeled in one direction at the yeah. crease, as we know, towards the batsman. Okay. So those are the few ideas that I use. And then coupled with that, we know that all of them at the end of the day are fielders. Yeah. So I want them to be able to, to withstand the demands of being on the field for a long period. So yeah. then there will be something that is pretty similar for everyone to target that, that uh, aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So on the couch, right, Jody, me, I'm all about the mental game, right? Mm -hmm. And so do you think there's a link between the mind and the body, firstly? Mm -hmm. uh, and if so, how do you train that from a fitness trainer point of view? Yeah. I definitely think there's a link. Um, I think everything starts with the mind, in fact. The, the idea of going up and getting up and wanting to train, that's all firstly mental. So I think the mind links in the point that it leads you, it, 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 it portrays the, the image that you, you, you see at the end and then you use your body as a tool to get that at the end. Okay. So, for example, how I train that in with, with, with some of the Lions guys is that they have specific targets, for example, they want to get to because they've been advised maybe by the national team trainer of that's their expectation. Yeah. So if they've got that long-term vision and that long-term goal, then what do I do? I challenge them in my, in my sessions. So my sessions will be specific Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, then on the Friday, before we close shop, what I'll do is I'll put in a, something like a challenge. It's a physical challenge, it's a mental challenge because it puts you through your paces, it makes you very uncomfortable, yeah. but you know at the end of the day, it's, it's helping you get towards that end goal that you want. Yeah. Yeah. So do you believe something like your, that, that by going through physical challenges, by putting your body, your physical body through challenges, that you strengthen your mind? Yes, I definitely do. I definitely do think that when you're uncomfortable in the gym, when, 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 when it's pressure time, when legs are sore, when heart rates are up, yeah. and there's still more exercises to complete, I definitely think that's got a lot to do with the mental, mental side of things and character. Obviously, a trainer's there as well to push you, that helps, but you learn to then withstand all those demands and all those vigors of hardships in terms of everything just being tired and sore and, and, and blown out. 
but yeah. you can still carry on. And that I think that's a mental edge more than anything. Yeah. Because science will only, for example, get you somewhere. Your legs can only do so many squats. But then for the last five, when your legs say, stop, do you listen to that inner voice or don't you listen to it? Do you carry on? And that's where the mental edge comes in. Yeah. Okay, cool. Do you think that injury, um, injuries that happen on the field, mm. have you ever found that there's a, a correlation between mental state and injury? I.e., the, the quad tears because the quad is just overworked versus the quad tears because there's something happening mentally for the player too. And so that's a part of the body that almost gives in because of the mental turmoil or the mental struggle or the mental whatever. I do think it's a bit of both there, Jody, yeah. because if a player previously, I've known a couple of players as well, who've had maybe so shoulder dislocations, for example, because of diving. And then at first, the reason they dove in the first place, they didn't have that injury or, or anything yeah. of sort. So that injury happened. And that's not because of necessarily overwork or anything, it's just maybe technique and landing. Yeah. And then the second time after that, they come back, they maybe don't want to bowl as fast, they hold back, they maybe don't want to dive anymore because they've got fear of that injury reoccurring again. Yeah. So I would say these injuries happen with a bit of both. So sometimes it's a mental edge, you can come back because you're holding back, you're holding back, and then a situation comes about where you can't hold back and you go and then you get that injury again. Or the mere fact you, it's out of your mind, it's out of sight, you're not worried about it, and incorrect uh, execution of a, maybe a, a technique of, of such, and then boom, an injury. So yeah. I'd say it's a bit of both. Uh, yeah. both. In, in that situation, right, where a player like dislocated his shoulder and now there's that fear, mm. how would you go about um, helping them or assisting them from a, just from, from your skill set point of view to, to, to manage the, the fear or to even just get them to perform at their best in spite of that injury? For me, it will be about in purely progressions. And what I mean about that, I just mean ability to do more, especially in the training and the rehabilitation. Yeah. So an athlete will know his state and his ability after, let's, let's say he's starting his rehab, he'll know, okay, this is how much his shoulder can manage yeah. uh, at this intensity. But as you do the rehab and as you start the strengthening and the reconditioning and he improves his strength, flexibility, which are the key components and all yeah. of that, as the weeks progress, you've got a data that can illustrate to the player that look, after week one of your injury, you started here, this is how much you could manage. But now look, after these weeks you can manage this much. Mm -hmm. And there you you pain free. So yeah. look at the progressions you've made, which means you, you're ready. Yeah. You're even more than ready. You, you can go again. So the fear component then is addressed in, 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 in the sense that you, sh you can show him his progressions. But then also I think it's important for someone mentally to come into that and advise the guy that these are the things going forward. But this is how you can count it. Whenever that... Uh, that the fear comes up in the field or whatever, whatever this is how you can go forward yeah. with a certain um, positive reinforcement. So, so do you keep accurate records of all your athletes sort of training throughout the year and knowing where they're at that you could then also reference for them if they've had an injury to know where they were when they were at their strongest? Yes, we do that. So I do, I, I use the, what I call the bare necessities because a lot of tools you can use. What I like to gauge with is their weight. I like to uh, get their kilograms throughout probably every week or every 10 days at latest. So that's how I try and do all the time. And it's just a key point and a, and a check in for me to see where they are. Yeah. And then um, with that, other tools you can use. You, yes, we test pre-season, mid-season and end-season, but that's far and few in between because there's a lot of games. Yeah. So other tools I'd use is maybe the skin fold. Sometimes you can use a hand grip strength test which is a simple test, you just grab the instrument yeah. and it just displays the amount of force they are able to produce. And that shows you if he, uh, neurologically, the guy is still ready, he's firing, he's strong and he's fresh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So my last question to you, right, okay, so. is your domain, right, so fitness, mm -hmm. my domain, the mind, and peak performance. Mm -hmm. How do you see uh, those three domains, sort of, or our domains working together to achieve peak performance for cricketers? Okay. Well, firstly, I think the environment is crucial. Yeah. The culture that's set yeah. in a team environment is very crucial because that brings about all the positivity, yeah. all the support you need yeah. in good times and in bad times because yeah. you know in sport the, the times are tough and times are good at times. Yeah. So that culture that you create, and that starts from the top, 
So whoever is, I wouldn't say in charge, but whoever is taking the responsibility, your head coaches, your captains, your mental coaches, if you've got the, you've got the luxury of that, is it's important to create that sort of culture at first. Yeah. Once you've got those values and culture and ideas and pillars that you believe in, then all that's left is for all the action to be taken. And all the action is mainly physical. It's skills-wise, it's fitness-wise, it's uh, recovery-wise, it's discipline-wise. It's yeah. eat, all those things. So once you've got that, then I think you, you're breeding an environment of high performance and peak performance. Guys can excel. Yeah. Guys can do their best. Guys know they can trust the people who are leading them. Yeah. So that's how I think all of those three domains link up. Link up. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. It's only a pleasure. Thank you. Perfect, perfect. You. So I hope that you really enjoyed this episode. And um, you, as always, you're more than welcome to comment below. If there's anybody else you'd like for me to interview, throw their no names below. And please, as always, you can share, pass on, tag a friend, like, uh, do whatever you want to do with this video, to be perfectly honest. Have a good day. Bye-bye.